This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Well, it's terrifying, particularly the first couple of times you do it. The thing that lets all of them down are the shots of the actors, the artificial because they're green screen. Doing something you passionately believe in rather than trying to appeal to some desire that you imagine other people have for what they want to see in a film. I think you have to be true to your own passion and your own sense of what excites you as a storyteller. From rotating hallways, filming on melted glaciers, exploding a jumbo jet, to now basically setting off an atomic bomb, Christopher Nolan remains one of a select group of directors and filmmakers who are committed to doing everything as practically as they can, with his new film Oppenheimer having reportedly used no CGI elements at all. There are no CGI shots in the movie. So let's take a peek into the story of one of Hollywood's most intriguing directors and the insane practical effects he's pulled off throughout his career. Is he a genius or is he an overrated madman? Doesn't matter which side you're on, as all are welcome to Christopher Nolan's world of practical effects. Buckle up and prepare for a ride. Plug in some earplugs or else you could die. Watch an IMAX explosion, it's not CGI. Is that a real cornfield that's really sci-fi? It's Christopher Nolan's, it's Christopher Nolan's, it's Christopher Nolan's world of practical effects. Even though Christopher Nolan began his time with earlier films like Memento and Insomnia, the story of his next level practical effects obsession begins in early 2003 when Nolan brought an insane idea to Warner Brothers. Where are you? That's right, Batman Begins, a dark and realistic take on one of the most recognizable superheroes in the genre at that time and still today. I'm Batman and one that no one would draw inspiration from 1982's Blade Runner. No one loved how this film, as he said, gave an interesting lesson on the technique of exploring and describing a credible universe that doesn't appear to have any boundaries. And he took that to the extreme, working with production designer Nathan Crowley. Together they designed an entire city in Nolan's garage that took inspiration from New York, Chicago, and Tokyo. We wanted the look of Gotham to have a recognizable texture, like a sort of New York on steroids. This is a model of what really are the slums of Gotham that I made uh, myself in, in Chris's garage. After figuring out the look and feel of the city, they rented the Cardington Airship Hangars. These massive hangars were built in 1915 and have been used frequently over the years for all sorts of films and videos like Star Wars, a Rihanna music video, Inception, and several other well-known films. It was at this massive location that they would build a soundstage from scratch and create the Narrows portion of the city for the movie. When we first started looking at Cardington, I think that there was probably a certain amount of skepticism from everybody, really, because it wasn't a ready-made stage by any means. It actually took us 10 months from the moment we took over that place to the moment where we were able to shoot in there. During their time at Cardington, they would all but build a city within the hangars, custom lighting everything from street lights to storefront signs. And many actors said that when you stepped into the hangars, it felt like you were stepping into another world, into the world of Gotham. And this helped a lot with the principal filming, giving the actors something tactile and real to work with over the heavy trends toward green screen at that time. When you are in Gotham and Cardington, you think that you are in a major city because it's so vast. It's almost like a limitless set. It's like putting eight of the largest LA sound stages in one building. It was truly incredible what they had built for this movie, including building an entire freeway that ran the entire length of the hangar, full of signs and intricate wiring beneath the set that could trigger different practical effects. Basically, we're incorporating two parts of Gotham City, the Narrows, and then the second part of the set, which is beyond us, further down the hangar, is really the main drag of Gotham main drag will have a lot of traffic in. We're looking at running, you know, maybe 50 odd cars through the set. From early on in the series, it was made very clear that no one wanted to use as little as possible green screen and CGI for any of the scenes or stunts. And that included stunts with the Batmobile. This was custom designed and completely drivable, and it also included six smaller models that they would use for various aspects of the filming part as well, including some miniature processes. And the creation of the Batmobile, the drivable one, took over nine months and several million dollars to create. We wanted to be able to use the Batmobile as a real car and have a real car chest that looks back to, you know, the French Connection and films like this, not the usual kind of studio-bound 
uh, use of the Batmobile. The first night of tracking, they were shouting out speeds of 86, 88 miles an hour. I've never done speeds like that, only on helicopter tracking shots. But to do it from car to car tracking is it's fast. One memorable stunt they did with the vehicle was in Shepperton Studios, where they created a massive bat cave, complete with a massive 12 pump waterfall and built from rocks from actual caves. The bat cave starts with the rigging, and we go into wood, and we're saying this was an underground uh, lake that's drained out. So we're, we're actually building a river that runs through here. And slowly but surely, we end up with a bat cave. And I'm sure you all remember this awesome scene of the Batmobile jumping through the waterfall and into the cave to evade the police chasing him. From this first high-budget movie Christopher Nolan directed, you could begin to see the characteristics that would define a typical Christopher Nolan film from Batman Begins to Oppenheimer. And practical effects are really the way to go. Who needs all that behind-the-scenes wizardry and coding to get a lesser end result? You want it to show up just right when you design it, without having to hope you'll be able to fix it in post. And that's where our sponsor Squarespace comes in with their brand new Fluid Engine. The next generation website design system that allows you to completely customize your site for both desktop and mobile. Stretch your imagination online with Fluid Engine, built in and ready to go on any new Squarespace site. Now you can just click, drag, and move objects around easier than ever to achieve your creative vision for your website. Give it a try today by heading over to squarespace.com right now for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash frame voyager to save 10 percent off your first purchase of a website or domain perform this feat in a manner never before seen by yourselves or any other audience anywhere in the world now the movie that sticks out like a bit of a sore thumb is prestige in 2006 at least when it comes to practical effects while there were practical effect elements and other vfx added in post here there wasn't really much that stands out in this production but i wanted to make sure you guys knew i wasn't skipping over this one so let's move on to the next batman movie Considered one of Nolan's best films and perhaps one of the greatest superhero films of all time, The Dark Knight took the practical effects approach of Batman Begins and made it more explosive. I'd be dumb here not to mention that this was the first movie Nolan used IMAX cameras for, and of course he would continue to after this. Now, with there being countless practical effects throughout this movie, we're going to focus on a couple of the ones we thought were some of the cooler ones, so let's keep our themes of explosion going. I think you're all familiar with this hospital scene. Interestingly enough, this was not in the original script to actually blow up the hospital, but they figured it out in pre-production that it could be done and hey, why not? And this is actually a bit of fun movie trivia. You know how Heath Ledger's character, the Joker, acted like there was something wrong when the initial explosion stopped, and then slightly after that, the full explosion of the hospital went off. Many people think, or have said, that it is actually an accident, and it is often reported that he improv that in the moment. That's actually not true. And the reason it's not true has to do with it being a real life practical explosion. You see, the script called for the Joker to exit the hospital as the building was exploding. Obviously, with a real life explosion, you can't just have a real person and try to walk out while the building's exploding. So the team purposefully designed the pyrotechnics to be delayed so that Heath Ledger could make it a safe distance away from the building before it completely exploded. We can chalk that rumor up to the fact that Heath Ledger was just such a good actor, it was so easy to believe he had just improvised that whole scene. This might be one of the most memorable scenes in The Dark Knight, and considering that this flip had to happen in the middle of the banking district, there was a little margin for error. If the truck gets flung into the air, the effects team had to ensure that the vehicle would land in the middle of the street, making sure that no public or private property was destroyed. And far more important that no one in or out of the film crew gets injured. While the street looks pretty empty, someone was actually mad enough to drive this truck. The guy who drove it is Jim Wilkie, a professional stunt driver who also contributed as a stuntman to Inception's production. Jim Wilkie got into the Hollywood stunts world after his military service in Vietnam. Jim impressed everyone with his ability to drive big rigs, which ensured his place in a close-knit community of stuntmen. 
If you see a big truck flip over or crash in another film, chances are Jim Wilkie was probably behind the wheel. In order to keep Jim safe though, the truck's cabin was reinforced with steel, making the inside almost look like a race car. But one question still stands. How does one flip a massive semi truck over as if it was nothing? It couldn't be explosives planted on the trees. The way the truck flips also excludes cable wires as a possibility. And as we already gathered, the truck isn't a miniature either. The team decided that the best solution would be a gigantic piston built right into the back of the truck, which gets pushed onto the ground using TNT, propelling the truck vertically and flipping it over. This method was perfect as it minimized cover up work by the VFX team and it was a relatively safe to conduct stunt as it only had a range of deviation of about six inches. And it spared the viewers from potentially experiencing a dated digital effect when rewatching the movie in years to come. Most of the time, nothing is better than simply doing it for real. Inception is a strange film in many ways, and while its writing is at times made fun of, though personally I think it's one of his better films, it was not lacking in special effects and extraordinary stunt work, with some scenes being more mind-boggling than others. One of those scenes must be the infinite staircase, with the two characters walking up a flight of stairs which lead to nowhere, but which actually end up being an impossible, endless staircase. The trick seems to be, but rather forced perspective, achieved with a distorted staircase which abruptly ends at the top, which then reconnects to an impossible looping structure when the camera, which is mounted on a robotic crane, is fixed at a certain position. It had to be done mathematically perfect. And in that, it had to be a particular lens at a particular height and distance, and the camera had to drop in a particular way to hide the trickery. If you look closely, you can even spot how the trick is done. The staircase is one structure with the top portion of the stairs looking relatively normal, while the bottom is quite distorted and disproportioned. If you pay attention to the railing, you can even see it vibrate more and more with the actors walking up the stairs, while the railing that should connect the top vibrating half remains still. But this is quite hard to spot if you're immersed in watching this film and trying to figure out what's even going on. Now this next scene is one that may make a view you repose more questions. The hallway fight scene with people navigating through a rotating room. And unless you do this on an airplane, there's only really one way to pull this effect off. And Nolan definitely wasn't the first person to do it. A notable example for the impossible rotating room and one which might even be a little bit more convincing in presentation due to its simplicity is a rather straightforward scene of a man running in a space station filmed with a both fixed camera and even with a camera following the jogger through the space station in 2001 Space Odyssey. I mean, you see the entire set rotating and the camera follows and the actors have to uh, hit certain marks, otherwise they will fall down because the set rotates. That was what Kubrick did. Anything that was presented to him as a challenge or something to do, he would immediately figure out how to flip it on its head, do exactly the opposite of what everybody had ever done before. In the Stanley Kubrick classic, The Space Station, in which the crewmate did his gravity-defying cardio workout, it was essentially a oversized hamster wheel, and there were various scenes for which rotating room effect was used. It was most notably Kubrick's 2001, uh, and I like the idea of repurposing that technology and really trying to, to choreograph an entire fight sequence and camera movement and all the rest, really do something that could be completely in camera in a way that you know, I hadn't, hadn't seen before. And while in 2001, the actors in the scene did relatively simple movements, while the room was rotating in Inception, the actors were engaging in a fight, making the happenings on screen significantly more dynamic, but also considerably more dangerous. There's a series of, I think, eight 30-foot diamonds of rings which were all joined together, and each one of those rings was rotated using an electric motor. As the room is revolving, the actors have to keep up with the rotation and execute their choreography in order to make the scene appear natural. If they are too slow, they could seriously hurt themselves. Once we fall into the hotel room, the game is very different than when we were in the corridor. It was easier, but it was more dangerous, because if you mess up and get behind the rotation, you can fall and really hurt yourself. Whereas in the corridor, you're only falling eight feet or something and have pads, so it didn't feel great, but it's not a big deal. When you fall 20 or 30 feet, that's bad. Later on, everyone was rigged and suspended in the rotating rooms, gliding through it as if they were in a zero-G environment. What you see is shot to shot to shot. Uh, it tends to be a different orientation, a completely different rig 
in each shot. The vertical corridor is, is supposed to be the same location as the horizontal corridor, and it's an identical set. The difference is that it has been built vertically, so it's standing on its end. And this means we can drop actors, st stunt performers, on wires down into the set, and the camera looks up at them. And they can then be raised or lowered, they can swing around inside the set, and it looks like they're floating in zero gravity. Filming inside of the centrifuge was also a difficult task. Either a camera was fixed in place in order for the actors to appear as if they were walking up walls and ceilings, or a camera was crane operated moving into and out of the rotating hallway. Any of the sets that required this movement, all the equipment had to be locked into this set. It either had to rotate with it if it made sense, or the, the set would rotate out of, out of the light. So it did require a lot of planning uh, on my part in order to determine what was going to happen with lights when the set moved and what was going to happen with the camera. Is the camera separate from the set or is it actually rotating with the set? It looks like we're jumping on the ceiling and stuff. In order to actually get it done, I couldn't think of it that way. I had to think of it as, this is the ground. Okay, now this is the ground. To be fair, at this point in time, it was an amazing effect and was incredibly convincing, if not a little bit dizzying to witness in theaters. All right, the last Batman movie, and the one that audiences and critics seem to be the most mixed on. Having to wait an agonizing four years in between Batman movies to finally get a conclusion. But even though this one is often rated towards the middle or bottom of Nolan's best works, it's chock full of practical effects yet again. And one scene just seemed too crazy to be real. Just how much of this scene was actually done for real? Naturally, of course, the scenes were well planned, meaning that any scenes taking place inside of a plane without the outside world clearly visible could be filmed in a studio with green screens or projection methods depicting the outside and the movements of the plane being simulated. No doubt, CGI played a significant role in the making of these effects too. The big plane did actually exist, but it was likely never connected to the smaller plane below. Instead, the fuselage was likely carried by a helicopter the entire time. In this featurette, we can see how the fuselage is prepared for the scene connected to a helicopter and lifted into the air. Stuntmen can also be seen jumping out of the plane and eventually parachuting down to the ground. And by looking at this video, we can also conclude that the stuntmen actually were sitting on the plane, so really not much CGI was needed as almost everything was somehow done, practically. With Chris Nolan, as much as we can physically do inside of that lens is where he would like to go. We had them on the outside of the aircraft, shooting through the windows, and it was a big thing to come together. Some more fun movie trivia for the scene is the little bit of trickery the production team created to keep this very visible to the public scene they were filming from getting spoiled, with some news organizations saying, quote, the movie crew desperately wanted to film this. It's a key section of the film. Batman is on board a plane that is hurtling to the ground. The script says he takes control of it and lands it on the road while it's on fire. People are going to love it. It's a tremendous challenge. No one cared who I was till I put on the mask. The one scene that definitely didn't need any digital help though was the ending of the sequence, when Bane holds on to the doctor and disconnects the wire from the fuselage, sending it tumbling down below them. Looking closely, Bane and the doctor look a bit artificial here. That is because they are mannequins. <laughs> In a behind the scenes recording from Filmatic, we can see how the plane, mannequins, and cameras are rigged up and that the fuselage did actually fall for real. I'll be honest. As a big science fiction fan, this is probably my favorite Nolan film, from the unforgettable soundtrack from Hans Zimmer to the philosophical questions it asked and to the throwbacks to 2001 Space Odyssey. You know, I know it's not for everybody, but I'm kind of a sucker for these dense sci-fi films. Now, while no one might not be popular in the aviation industry after brutalizing multiple planes, he may have a bit more luck in the farming industry if the film business somehow isn't working out for him anymore. And as we've established, Nolan is a big fan of doing things practically. And since natural catastrophes and agriculture are pivotal concepts in Interstellar, Nolan and his team decided to buy a plot of land and grow corn on it. We really wanted to get some sense that this corn was being farmed somewhere that it probably shouldn't be. And indeed, they don't farm a lot of corn where we were farming it in Calgary because uh, the wind out of the mountains can kill it very easily. Not being dissuaded from filming in his preferred location, and let's just be clear, this is not a confirmed report, but it has been reported that Christopher Nolan himself peered into a black hole with an IMAX camera 
and found a man that was just crazy enough to grow corn there. You grow corn here, you're living on the edge. This would be, on, as I said to them at the time, this is kind of on the edge of common sense. We've never grown corn here. Nobody has, I don't think, anywhere out here. We seeded it May 10th. This was a big risk, with deadlines and scheduling actors to be on location at specific times, and not to even mention that this farm location would be featured throughout the movie if the corn didn't grow. They faced a lot of delays or intense CGI headache solutions. Like July 8th, it was just barely knee high. I said, this ain't gonna work, boys. Then go straight enough corn grows very fast, and by the moment we started shooting, it's, it started reaching the perfect height. Yeah, you know, we came out there and it was miraculous how quickly it grew in the last couple of weeks. We have 350 acres. At another uh, location, we have another 500 acres. You know, when you look at it and its scale, it's, it's quite huge. The decision to do that stems from the want to have mountains on the horizon contrasting the expansive cornfields. And judging by the end result, growing that corn was the right decision. With a car plowing through the fields and the corn being such a prominent element of the film, having real plants on screen is a big plus, eliminating the need to create a digital, you know, less convincing cornfield environment. What's funny about this situation, though, is that Christopher Nolan consulted with Zack Snyder on how to optimally grow corn for Interstellar, as Zack Snyder had also done this for Man of Steel. And the funny thing is, after the film was done, they were able to actually sell all this corn and make a profit off of it. We made a strange deal. We got involved in the corn business. Basically, we invested in the crop, and if all the corn was lost, then we would never get our money back. But if he sold it like or used it as silage, then he was, it was free which at the end of the day, we ended up making all of it back because they, they cropped it pretty well. With the plant life covered, what about the natural disasters, the space exploration and the science fiction stuff, right? Because we're talking about a science fiction movie here that goes to space, not just plants. To start off, the dust storms were real, a relatively simple effect achieved by shoveling dust into gigantic fans during a shoot. So each spot, we just tried to get as many machines and as much dust in the air as we could. I have to say, I completely underestimated how much dust we were gonna produce and on the day, I mean, the town was covered. Something like a dust storm is very, very difficult to do with uh, visual effects. As soon as the dust is in the air, it completely transforms the lighting environment, how the light reacts. But to do something that actually really looks real and really fits in with the tone of the rest of the film that you're, you're struggling to, to give some, some reality to, you really have to, to do that for real. The dust would also coat the cornfields, naturally muting the normally vibrant green plants. And it's safe to assume that the actor's performances were made considerably more convincing as you don't really have to fake dust getting blown into your eyes. It's just happening to you. With Chris, everything has to be real and practical. So you find yourself sometimes standing by a totally fake, beautiful farmhouse in the middle of a completely fake, massive cornfield in the middle of a totally fake dust storm. And that's when you know you're on a Chris Elman movie. Similar to The Dark Knight, on location shoots and impressive prop work found their way into Interstellar as well. The otherworldly infinite oceans or Icelands, for instance, have a rather earthly origin, one that wasn't recreated in a studio using big screens and CGI, but rather by filming in the middle of the surreal and desolate Icelandic nature. In the story, Iceland is used as both uh, what we call Miller's planet and man's planet. And so we went there initially uh, looking for the ice planet. And then um, we started looking for the water planet because we noticed on the map something that we'd, we'd seen years before, which is these great deltas where the water goes across the, the black volcanic material into the, into the sea. But what we were looking for on the water planet was water that looked very deep, but actually was quite shallow. That combined with a two-scale spaceship and well-designed spacesuits, a viewer might really believe that what they are seeing is an alien world. To be able to film at this very remote location, they had to pave a road for 15 kilometers, put pipes along the way, also they could bring in a crane for their two-scale spaceship. The location was, was perfect, really, in that the sand underneath the water was very, very firm, uh, allowed us to put our very heavy spaceship out in the, in the middle of it. It really is Nolan's dedication to doing as much practically, including this spaceship, that really gives Interstellar a very tactile feel that you don't always find in a lot of modern sci-fi movies today. Even going old school and using miniatures for majority of the space scenes, hearkening back again to 2001 Space Odyssey's legacy. 
The Ranger weighed about 14,000 pounds. We had a lot of mechanical parts, the landing gear, the doors had to open, a lot of stuff had to function. We drove around in these, they look like sort of 15 passenger vans, but the wheels are about four feet in diameter. They're up on high, and so they'd go through the water just like it was a puddle. And we'd just be driving around. Everything was kind of on platforms or in those vans. And, and they'd always be running around trying to move out of the frame. And uh, we shot the whole sequence like that. Focusing so much effort in depicting Interstellar's world through props, sets, screen projections, and puppeteering charismatic box-shaped robots also elevates the VFX heavy scenes, such as the sequence in which Cooper navigates through the Tesseract. Chris, he was like, I'll be honest, I'm not really sure where he's gonna go at the moment because we're still working it out. He's like, but be prepared to, to fly him anywhere within this box. We'd have it all dialed in, we'd bring Matthew over, we'd show him the action and what he would have to do. And he'd be like, okay, put me up. So we'd put him on, take him up, and, and he'd replicate it again and again when they needed it. And it worked really well. And even when he really did get into very heavy CGI scenes, including the black hole scene, they still very much based it as much in reality as they could. But let's get back down to Earth. Dunkirk was anything but simple to film. Harsh weather conditions, sets continually being destroyed, boats and planes needing to be coordinated throughout the entire production, and the cherry on top, most of it was shot on IMAX. We straight away started talking about the big format. We have a big love for the big format. I mean, especially IMAX, you know, it's a very visceral window to the world. The difficulties on set many times revolved around the weather. From day one till the end of shooting the movie, the crew had little luck with it with the winds and torrential downpour obliterating their set at times and interrupting shoots consistently, and Mother Nature really made sure to exhaust the crew pretty much every day. With major logistical hurdles, safety boats, camera boats, makeup and hair, and every time that you shot in a certain direction, all those boats would have to move so that they were out of the shot, and, and that was an incredible thing to get a glimpse of. Probably one of the craziest things about this film in general is the fact that no one used all real boats. They didn't CGI boats into these sequences. They had them all out there on the water to simulate these battles. And with unpredictable weather and the already difficult proposition of coordinating that many boats at once, it was a Herculean endeavor to get all of this filmed correctly. In the Marine Department people, it's probably one of the most taxing and hardest movies on water that they've ever done. In terms of marine movement and that marine work was certainly one of the bigger water days in, in, in filmmaking. I remember at the end of the day, like I was dizzy and I was standing next to Nilo Otero and, <laughs> and standing next to Chris and we called cut. And I remember Chris just kind of calmly looked over at Nilo and I, Chris goes, that was good. And Nilo and I just looked at each other and just sat back and started laughing. It was like, we were coming in my hotel room that night, just collapsing. There were other problems which were not weather related. How does one portray masses of people when only so many extras are present on location? Of course, no one could have called up Industrial Light and Magic or Weta and utilized crowd simulations or green screened extras in to fill the blanks. But the crew opted for a much lower tech solution, which is frankly ingenious and it's something that's been used throughout cinema's history. Cardboard cutouts. Rows of human shaped pieces of cardboard with the occasional person moving their head from behind the props to make those inanimate rows of cardboard come alive. Beyond these cutouts, we also have to appreciate how much was done for real in Dunkirk. Everything from plane crashes into the oceans. Oil patches catching fire in the waters. IMAX cameras recording these intense plane fights in scale of how much was going on in a very uncontrolled environment. This is probably one of Nolan's craziest films he ever pulled off. Tenet is that one movie that even the hardiest Christopher Nolan fan can't quite put a finger fully on what the hell happened in the movie. And honestly, this line in the movie best describes how you should approach even watching it. Don't try to understand it. Feel it. This movie is just full of absolutely insane practical effects and stunts throughout it. But maybe none was advertised as much as Christopher Nolan deciding it was cheaper to blow up an airliner jet in real life than it would be to do in CGI. The scene essentially speaks for itself, and it must have been a lot of fun, honestly, to pull off, damaging not only a plane in the hangar, but also totaling a few cars in the process, too. A little bit like playing GTA 5 in real life. Right in the plane crash, I knew I wanted to try and do it in some ways in camera. One of the first things I asked Chris was, you know, how big do you want the plane? He uh, laughed, and I said, I think I can get you a real plane. Nolan said that it's a strange thing to talk about, a kind of impulse buying 
I suppose. But we kind of did, and it worked very well. And to be fair, it seems to only have cost around $12 million of the $200 million budget they had. So in the end, I guess, maybe a good deal? Or perhaps no one wishes he could have reversed time like in the movie, which, what is it with those reversed world scenes in Tenet though? Just how would an effects team do these practically? Actually, not much work was conducted by the effects guys for the reverse scenes. Rather, the actors, stuntmen, and excellent choreography did all the heavy lifting. These moves we've never seen before. I mean, these stunt guys who've been around a long time, they were learning, which was the fun challenge of it all. Everything was filmed in reverse, which might be more noticeable when looking at how stilted characters look when moving forward. You can also often observe an actor, extra, or stuntman looking over their shoulder periodically while walking, which makes more sense when reversing the reversed scenes, for which you can watch this excellent video here, which showed a bunch of Tenet reverse world scenes and played them back in their original form. Sometimes the most perplexing effect doesn't require a prop, explosion, or intricate set pieces. Sometimes all you need is something as simple as reversing your already shot footage which I guess you could call visual effects, in a way. Have you ever wondered what it was like to witness a nuclear bomb explode? Aside from archive footage of the real atomic blasts, we now have an impressive artist's rendition filmed in IMAX. What we were able to get into the finished film, to me, is extraordinarily beautiful, but also very frightening. After looking at the trend of Christopher Nolan just doing stuff for real, you might get slightly concerned looking at the atomic blasts in Oppenheimer. What did Nolan do when a bunch of the effect work in his movies consists of actually doing the things that are supposed to happen on screen? He wasn't really going to set off an atomic weapon for real. Right? A lot of experimentation. We came up with some very interesting analog methods, all of which was leading to the Trinity test. Luckily, no actual nukes were detonated for Oppenheimer, although I'm sure that if Christopher Nolan had the opportunity to, he would have dropped one. The blast was rather achieved with a cocktail of explosives, using things like propane and gasoline, as those are rather cheap but provide quite a lot of bang for the buck. But to sell the illusion of the explosion being a real nuke going off, more compounds had to be added to the mixture. Two metals, which were highlighted in an interview with Slash Film, were magnesium powder and aluminum powder. But why add these powdered metals in the first place? While regular explosives make massive fireballs and are loud as hell, they're not enough to simulate the look of an atomic blast and get that nice mushroom cloud effect. What is a nuclear explosion without the terrifying bright light in the beginning? This is where the magnesium powder comes in. Uh, but a brilliant white light. So you can see this here, bring the lights down, please. So a brilliant white light as the magnesium reacts with the oxygen from the air. When ignited, magnesium powder burns white, with the flame being so bright that it is advised not to look at it directly for an extended period of time. Aluminum powder can also have a blinding effect when ignited, and it can even create a whole lot of sparks. Unsurprisingly, both powdered aluminum and magnesium are used as a tool to stun and disorient people in the police and military, with aluminum and magnesium being popular ingredients for flashbangs, stun grenades. All of this though just makes one wonder how much of that powder was used for the blast in Oppenheimer. It must have really been a significant amount. But you know what else Christopher Nolan loves destroying? IMAX cameras. You should check out all the times he destroyed IMAX cameras right here.